Hallelujah, I like that. That was good today. We're going to continue our study. This is study number 48. I've called it Peacemaker or Troublemaker, right? Hey, I want to, I want to make a comment here. We had a, in our Bible study on Saturday morning, I don't, I don't know, that no, no, it wasn't talking about, I was talking about some things that had happened in my past when we had somewhere where we had gone to church before and I want to make it very, very clear, especially when I get to a subject like anger, and I want you as a church to appreciate what I'm saying is that I'm not targeting anybody in this message or any other of these messages. I'm going to have several on anger. I don't know how many I've already uh, started on next week's and <laughs> reading some books and stuff, but I, I don't... I'm not targeting anybody. I'm just talking about something that needs to be talked about, you know, uh, about controlling your anger. I think, I, I think uh, maybe I'm wrong, I think that anger is a little bit more difficult for men to control for whatever reason uh, than it is for women. Uh, I, I'm just not sure why that might be. But uh, I want to be a peacemaker, right? I want to be somebody that brings peace into whatever circumstance I'm in. Maybe you've uh, been in a very difficult, very stressful circumstance at some time in your life and uh, where you were with somebody else who was able to actually bring some calm and some grace into those difficult moments. I've known some people like that, that you just, if you were around them, <coughs> excuse me, if you were around them, it was almost difficult to become angry. But if you, if there was some tension in the in the meeting or some tension in in the uh, in the circumstance that you found yourself, and they were there, that they had a unique way of bringing calm and peace and and uh, some wisdom and grace into that those difficult moments. It it may have been somebody that just knew how to diffuse anger. Uh, I, I remember, I remember those times in my life when I was, uh, when I was angry, long time ago, thank goodness. Uh, and I, 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 you know, my wife was, uh, was the one that would defuse me. Um, and, and she, in uh, she's, she's, she had that gifting, if I can call it that, to stay calm when I wasn't. And there's always somebody like that, you know, especially hopefully in a, every family, there's somebody that can do that. Uh, sometimes uh, you get angry and it's just a disaster waiting to explode. You know, you're gonna say things that you regret and uh, maybe do some physical things that you don't want to do. Uh, you're gonna act in a way that you shouldn't act that's completely inappropriate. And so you need somebody, uh, hopefully it would be you, uh, that would be able to neutralize all of the negative emotions and to bring about some sense of calmness and uh, peace into what we would really consider to be a very, very difficult circumstance. Uh, I want to call those. I want to call those people peace, peacemakers. I, the scriptures does. <coughs> we'll read a verse about that here in Matthew chapter five, just a, a, a few seconds here. I was reading a book and I. Uh, one author said that people, uh, peacemakers are people who breathe grace. And I just love that. I had to stop there for a little bit. I had to think about that, about what that really meant. That <coughs> Sweetheart, can you give me some water? <coughs> um, that uh, uh, somebody that is a peacemaker is somebody that can actually bring grace into the circumstance, whatever it may be. Now, that's what we all should want to be, a peacemaker and not a troublemaker, not a combatant. Peacemakers are people that are able to bring the various graces of Christ into a tense moment. I want to say that again. They're able to bring the graces of Christ, Christ-likeness, 
the fruit of the spirit, those kind of things into a difficult moment. They just bring it into it. They 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 let them sort of control. Uh, thank you, sweetheart. Uh, they let them control. Forgive me if you're watching on the video here. Um, and. Uh, they bring it into the conversation. They bring it into that moment. They understand that anger is just one short, one letter short of the word danger, right? D-A-N-G-E-R. And and uh, so uh, they sense that somebody's anger is about to rise. Uh, that and so immediately they are able to to calm everything down. They say the right thing. They just have. A grace of Christ about them and they find a way to cool down somebody's hot button maybe is a way that I could say it that we could understand and they speak words that are helpful and not hurtful uh, they speak words that are calming and not caustic I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 this is one of my favorite verses um, uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 15 1 if you'll turn there um, I use this verse all the time. You've heard me speak it many times before here, uh, teaching. <coughs> but Solomon said here in chapter 15, verse 1, he said, A soft answer turns away wrath, and a, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And if you remember, there was a time uh, uh, earlier on in our study when I talked about neural resonance which is a very, very real uh, uh, activity that goes on when two people are talking with each other, when two people are, are, are communicating with each other, whether it's good or bad. And neural resonance is that where, the, if, if I, let's just say for instance, that I say something that's kind of aggressive and and angry toward my wife, it's going to just make her a lot of times feel the same way. Uh, but you can, you can bring calmness and peace, and that, re that resonates with the other person's uh, uh, mental place that they are, uh, or it should in, 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 in many cases. And so a soft answer just, it turns away wrath. You, it just... It's really hard to argue with somebody that's not going to argue with you, right? It's hard to get angry at somebody that's not going to just sort of pick up your argument and, and be angry at you. And so they, they're going to say something that's calming and, and not very caustic. They speak words that are peaceful and not aggressive. You know, if you get angry, you're going to say aggressive things. You're going to say things that you regret. You're going to say regretful things maybe would be a way to say that. And, uh, the kind of people that we're talking about that are peacemakers are people that have that have actually uh, speak words of wisdom and, and not aggression. So every one of us should be a peacemaker. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. This is, uh, you're very familiar with this. This is the Beatitude and Jesus, this is the first message that Jesus taught that we know of uh, after he had been up, uh, after he had been up in his conflict with uh, with Satan, and but he gives this list of one, two, three, four, five. How many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, different areas of our life that he wants us to really understand. You remember I told you, and I want you to appreciate that, that whenever you come to a list in the scriptures, that it's very important because what happens in the listing of the information that God gives us, he's consolidating, he's consolidating something strategic that's important to him. And in verse 9, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so it's a blessing. It's a, the word here for blessed, I don't think it actually means happy. 
I think I've heard that many times before that it, people say, well, happy are the, you know, the, those who mourn. Uh, that's an oxymoron, actually, you know, uh, to, to say it that way. Or, uh, but it, it has a very different meaning to it. It means that God, that God blesses you when you're a peacemaker, that he adds his blessing in onto your life. The technical meaning of the word peacemaker, I went out and did some research on it, is that a peacemaker is someone who has actually received the grace and the peace of God in their own hearts, right? Uh, they've received it. They understand what it is, and so they're able to bring and offer God's peace and grace to others who are not actually experiencing it. So when you learn what it means to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker, what you're able to do, if I can say it this way, is to turn an unnecessary conflict that you may be engaged in, or somebody else says perpetually, you know, has, uh, has begun, that you turn an unnecessary conflict into a testimony of how God really wants people to live. You become, you become the testimony. You become the example. You become the model of what God, of what God really desires in the person that's creating all of the tension. We're, we're always going to have those moments in our life and those people that want to bring conflict in, into our life. So you become the person that God is able, to whom God is able to work. Now, I, I want to give you a sampling. This is just the sampling. I think I have three things that I, uh, that I want to glean, not, not out of today's study, but as we go through, as we navigate through this uh, topic of anger, just some things that we want God to teach us, and uh, there'll be more each week as I sort of build on, on, on what we're talking about here. The first is that you want to learn how to use every conflict that you face as an opportunity to demonstrate both the love and power of Jesus Christ to others. That's very important to me. I, that's why I put it first. So I, I come into a moment of conflict, something that's very difficult, something that has a lot of tension in it, something that is uh, not pleasant, and I want to use it as an opportunity where God can demonstrate his love and his grace and his power, the power of Christ to other people. You can only do this when you think like God thinks. Trust me, you cannot do this if you do not think like God thinks. You have to have a mind that's been converted to biblical thinking. That's the only thing that's going to work. Um, you want to be the peacemaker, right? You want to be the one who speaks the words that calm and diffuse uh, the, the difficult moment that, that is turning, and that looks like it's turning into an angry moment. I know this may sound a little, uh, I, don't, I don't want this to be oversimplified, but in reality, in reality, if needs be, you just need to walk away. You just need to turn and walk away, physically walk away out of the conflict that somebody may be creating. Uh, number two, you want to determine what are those areas in your own personal life that seem to consistently lead you to have conflict with other people. Let's just say that you are constantly battling conflict with somebody in your life. It could be somebody at work, it could, it could be in your home life, it could be a friend, it could be a relationship that you have, and you are constantly in conflict with them. Uh, it may be angry. There may be times when you become angry. There, it, 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 it may not, but you want to be able to determine and to evaluate what is it in me, what is it in your life that is actually contributing to that. What you don't want to do, and I, I, we'll talk about this a little bit later here, is that you do not want to blame everything on everybody else. That's not going to help, so it's their fault. Uh, that's really not where we're headed with this at all. And I think the best way to know what those areas are is to see what it is in the other person's life that they are always reacting to in your life. 
It may be the way that you say something, right? <coughs> right? It could just be, it, it, it could be, it, it could be this. You, you know, you're talking and you just go like this. You go, you know, and it just is a hot button for somebody else. Well, if it is, you want to stop it. You want to stop it. So it could be facial expressions. It could be, you could just be like this all the time, just not even listening. It could be a multitude of different areas that you want to evaluate. What am I doing to contribute to the anger that this other person is expressing in their life towards me? Or maybe I'm expressing it towards them. This is not necessarily a right or wrong issue, but exercising discernment so that you know what kind of behaviors and habits in your own life that you want to avoid when you sense, when you sense that something is getting a little elevated, when something is, when the heat's turned on, you know, in the kitchen and the, and, and uh, there's, a, there's emotions that are, strong emotions that are, are beginning to boil. Uh, you want to know what it is that creates the conflict and tension in the other person and leads to an angry exchange so that you can change, so that you can make a change in your life. Um, I love what Bonnie had to say about Larry, and, and uh, uh, 58 years is a long time, Larry. Uh, Brenda and I have been married 51 years, and, and, and we know what each other's hot buttons are, and we don't push them. My wife doesn't push uh, my hot buttons. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't really have any, uh, any more, I don't think, that are, are, are really significant. She doesn't. They might be warm buttons, you know. I, I call them a warm button. But... Uh, uh, we, you just don't want to. You just don't want to push it. it. It's not going to help. It's not going to benefit anybody. Number three, when you actually do hurt somebody with your words and aggression, let's say you are the aggressor. Let's say that you can't control your anger, and you say something that you should not say. At, at that. Once that happens, you need to know how to go back and resolve that and create reconciliation with the person that you have offended in some way. You said something that was hurtful, and you need to go back and confess those things to them so that you can create an atmosphere for forgiveness and for reconciliation. That may not always happen, but at least you've done your part, right? It may not always happen. You may not, the, the other person, you know, whoever it is, everybody's going to respond differently. If you're dealing with Christians, there ought to be forgiveness. And there really ought to be reconciliation. I'm all, I've always been, um, what's the right term? I've always been surprised. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. I've always been wondered why it is that Christians, that churches have split so often? Why people cannot get along in a, in a church? Uh, why there is uh, dissension and confusion and anger and uh, just a business meeting? Uh, uh, thank goodness we just don't have business meetings, right? Unless we absolutely need one. I, I can't remember the last time that we had one. Huh? Our committees. We, we, we just have a way of resolving things and deciding what we're going to do and how we're going to go about it. And most everybody knows what we're going to do. And there's no, there's no hide and seek here. We're not trying to elude anybody. But, but, but we're not doing things that are going to create tension. Uh, I think we're doing things as much as we can to alleviate tension in people's lives. Now, in order for any of this to work on your behalf and for any of what we're going to study to actually benefit you personally, you must know how God thinks on this issue of anger. God's thinking must become your thinking. Now, this is, that's the theme of this entire series that we're doing. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I want to use this. Uh, this is a, uh, I gave you a couple key verses last week, but this is another key verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. 
1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, a passage of scripture when Paul is talking to the Corinthians uh, uh, about their conscience and and, and 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 what they're doing and uh, but he sort of ends up this whole passage here with verse thirty one. And this is a key verse that you need to use to help this happen in your life if you're going to think like God thinks. It says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever it is that you're involved in, whatever, whatever kind of uh, activities there are in your life, what kind of relationships you have, whatever it is that you do, Paul says, God wants you to do all to the glory of God. Do everything to the glory of God. And that's a great question that you can ask yourself at any time during a conflict is what I'm saying, is what I am doing, is how I am responding or reacting. Is it something that is actually bringing glory to God? If it's not, it's not a good thing. You need to stop. That's, just, that's the simple way to say it. So here's what will happen. Here's what will happen. Let me just sort of just uh, make up a, 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 a scenario. Someone will say something or do something that hurts you in some way. That's, that's going to happen. Nobody is exempt from that. Somebody's going to say something. Somebody's going to do something that you don't like, that you just... Why in the world did they have to say that? Why in the world did they do that to me? Uh, they may mistreat you. They may lie to you. They may use you. They may become angry with you or speak down to you. You know, it was really interesting to me when uh, after we found out a day later that somebody had gone down to my barn and opened it up and stolen my uh, expensive... Um, uh, pressure washer and chainsaw. Uh, I, I really could have been angry about that, and I, I, I never, I never felt that way. I, I really didn't. I just, ne it, I mean, it wasn't anybody. I couldn't yell at them, you know. Um, and I wasn't going to go into the bedroom and get a pillow and put my face in it and start screaming. Uh, that wasn't going to happen. I, I just. You know, I told Brenda, I said, well, we just have to, I'll have to buy, buy another one and make sure it's locked up. And now I've locked the barn up, and every time I go down there, i got to get the key and unlock it and unlock the other door if I want to get one of the tractors out. And just, you know, it's like 9-11 and getting on an airplane anymore and what you have to go through security-wise. But I, I, I'm not angry. Thieves, thieves steal things, right? Uh, even if I had met the person, I wouldn't have been angry. I, I would have just, I, I think I would have said something like, this is not smart, you know. This is really not smart here. So I was talking to Chris, uh, I think I mentioned it last week, but he was talking to me. We were talking uh, several weeks ago or something about how he had, he would go into a very hostile environment, say uh, a domestic, a domestic argument which probably could be the worst thing that you could go into. That could be worse than a drug bust because once you go in and the husband's beating the wife and you start to take him out and she doesn't want you to, you know, she, she starts beating on you and no, no, and all of that. And, but he was telling me, he was just about how he diffuses those, how he diffused those circumstances in, in, in uh, you know, when he was there. So when that happens, what do you do? When somebody mistreats you, lies to you, uses you, becomes angry with you, speaks down to you in a condescending way, how are you going to handle it? What are you going to do? And what does God want you to do? And I think that's probably the better question. How do you respond in those moments? Does God want you to become angry? Everybody listen carefully. Does God want you to become angry and to lash back at somebody with some caustic, unkind, uh, sarcastic, unpleasant words 
when you speak your mind to that person? Say yes or no. No. I know that before that ever happens, that that is never how God wants me to respond to a very difficult moment, to respond the way maybe somebody else has responded to me. Uh, That's not even close to how God would want you to respond. So why respond that way? So if you do not settle this in your own mind, if this does not become a, a neural pathway, if this does not become the way that you think uh, uh, of, of what God wants to happen in your life first, then when somebody does hurt you, you're going to make some very unfortunate decisions. You're going to say some very difficult things, and you're going to be highly disappointed with the ensuing consequences of what has transpired. I don't think there's much of a way to get out of that. You know, I wish I had a pill you could take like that and all of a sudden everything's fine. Are you okay? Yep, I'm okay, I'm fine. It doesn't work that way. It's not going to happen that way. So, in fact, I would say, if you don't settle this issue, it only makes matters worse for both yourself and the other person. I want to give you key principle number 170. Key principle number 170. I think I have about three key principles in a row here. Uh, key principle number 170. Anger never resolves an issue. Anger never resolves an an issue. But only makes the issue worse. But only makes the issue worse. Anger never resolves an issue, but it only makes the issue worse. It's critical to appreciate that anger is an emotion that can be controlled. And I would say as we go through this study uh, that the key word that we're going to be looking at is self-control, but we'll get to that later. But anger is an emotion that can be controlled, but when it's not controlled, it's a very destructive emotion. It's very destructive. It's destructive in you. It's destructive in you physically, mentally, physiologically, uh, relationally. It's it's destructive in the other person in the same way. Uh, It can quickly destroy your relationships with people. It can hurt you in every way, every area of your life, because no one... I've never met anybody that says, man, I really like to, I love being around angry people. I just love outbursts of anger. I just can't hardly wait so that I can get around uh, so-and-so. They get angry all the time. I just love it. If you think that way, you're perverted. That's, that's, that's weird. That's all I can say. That's very, very, that would be very, very weird. Nobody, under, nobody likes that. Nobody likes angry words. Nobody likes angry emotions. And there's a reason that they don't like it. I can say it that way. No one enjoys somebody yelling at them and being spoken to harshly with demeaning words where you knothead, you jerk, you know, and and raising their voice and speaking that way. There's nothing good that can ever become of that kind of language and that kind of communication. No one enjoys that, and if it continues, it will ultimately lead to the destruction of what should have been a meaningful relationship. Now, I want to make a statement. I I probably should have made this a a key principle, but I didn't. But I think you ought to write this down. I think this is one of the key points uh, here. Is that meaningful relationships Meaningful relationships can never truly develop, can never truly develop in 
in an atmosphere, in an atmosphere of anger. Meaningful relationships can never truly develop in an atmosphere of anger. Let us assume that someone does something that hurts you. And it may be something that they actually do on a regular basis. Uh, uh, anger, once anger becomes a habit, that's about all you have to look forward to in somebody, right? They don't like what you said, they don't like what you did, they're going to become angry habitually. They have a neural pathway, they've created it, they've got a stronghold that the enemy has created in their life, they become angry, and it's just not a good thing. It could be how they talk to you, it could be how they treat you, it could be a lack of respect that they have for you, it could be anything that creates a sense of that emotion of anger inside of you. I just don't want to be with that person. I don't want to be around that person because I know that they're going to create this emotion of anger inside of me. I'm sure that all of us know somebody like that and uh, we want to stay away from them. If you choose to fight them, hurting you with anger, you cannot influence them. In other words, if they, if they are hurting you and anger is your mechanism to fight, you can't help them and you're not going to help yourself at the same time. Uh, anger is just not, uh, uh, it, it's not, uh, it's not a good advisor, right? <laughs> it's not a good way to, de to, to diffuse difficult moments. And so you'll not be able to influence them and you will become even more frustrated. Why? It's just because of what I just told you in key principle number 170. Anger never resolves an issue. Anger never resolves an issue. It only makes the issue worse. So when someone hurts you and you respond to them with gracious words, even words that express how what they have done has, has actually hurt you, I think that's appropriate. If, uh, let's, just say, let, let's just say that I got very angry with my wife. I'm not, but let's just say that I did. That I got very angry with her and, and, and I, I, I said something and, and it hurt her. Uh, it, it's okay for her to tell me that what I said has hurt her, right? I think that's part of diffusing me, if I can say it that way, so that I don't, so that I don't maintain that anger in, in my life. So if you, uh, if, if you respond with gracious words, uh, even words that express how what you've, they've done has actually hurt you, you can walk away from the conflict you can just kind of walk away from the tension without saying things that would only make the difficult moment worse and more difficult to resolve in the future. Listen, listen, anger was never designed by God to bring about reconciliation or healing in a relationship. Let me say that again. Anger was never designed by God to bring about reconciliation or healing in a relationship. It only makes, anger only makes what someone else has done to you more difficult to resolve. So here's what you will find. Here's what you will find. When you respond by expressing anger as your defense mechanism, your defense mechanism, I'm having trouble talking here today, uh, for the hurt that somebody has created in you, the conflict only intensifies. It only, in, it only intensifies. You've added wood to the fire, right? Where there's no wood, the fire goes out. So if you're using anger as a mechanism for reconciliation or in a defensive way for the hurt or the misunderstanding that somebody has created in you, you your conflict is only going to get worse. Stay away from it. 
Look, everybody look up here for a minute. Everybody, everybody look up here. Just walk away from it. Just walk away from it if you have to. Sometimes that may be difficult, but just walk away from it. I had, uh, when I worked at the Savannah River site a long time ago, uh, I had a boss that I, I really liked him. I liked his management style, but I didn't like the way that he talked. And uh, he was uh, very prone in a meeting. He was a, a level, probably a level two, a level two manager. So he was uh, he was he was elevated, and and uh, I was a lowly level four. And and but we'd get into a meeting, and he would he would. He would begin to curse, and he would use God's name in vain. And there was just something about that, that inside of me, just I could not handle it. You know, it was just I, I, I did handle it, but I didn't want to. I wanted to say something. And uh, for somebody at that level to be talking that way, and, and, and he knew that I was a Christian. I mean, I, know, I was rarely ever in a meeting with him by myself. Normally it was with the other managers and project wouldn't be going well and we'd be behind time or, you know, uh, behind schedule and over budget. It, I guess that was the nemesis that we lived with, wasn't it, Larry? You're, you're over budget and behind schedule. And uh, so, so uh, you, you got to be able to know how to, to handle the conflict so that you don't intensify it. Think of it this way. And just think of it this way. This is a, I think this is the right way to think of it. You can never be an angry peacemaker, right? Got to write that down. You can never be an angry peacemaker. Anger always makes things worse, and actually gives the other person an out for what they did that actually initiated the conflict in the first place. So let me give you a key principle, number 171, 171. Key principle number 171. The more angry of a person that you become, the more angry of a person that you become, the less meaningful relationships you can have. The less meaningful relationships that you can have. You know, I pray and I hope that I have a great relationship with everybody in this church. I love every one of you so much. I love your families, your children. I love you personally. There's nobody here that I don't like. There's nobody here that irritates me. There's nobody here that I, I don't want to be around. This is my church family. I love you, and I pray that I will never, you will never see me angry. Uh, and I know that if you did, it would hurt our relationship. And I don't want that to ever be the case. So the normal and natural response for that person who's constantly being yelled at or targeted with anger is to simply ignore the other person and eventually remove themselves from even having a relationship with them. If somebody's yelling at you all the time, you know, if, if they're always yelling at you all the time and getting angry with you, they, they can't have a meaningful relationship with you. You can't have a meaningful relationship with them. You, what your, your default position is, I don't want to be with them. I, I don't want to... Well, I don't want to go somewhere with them. I don't want to spend any, any time with them. And so once again, you have to remember what we have previously said, that anger may actually be very valid at times, but the greater and overriding issue, this is one of the key principles about anger that will follow us all the way through, is not that you have anger. It's not that you have anger. It's how you express anger. It's what you do with it. It's how you actually express and manage that 
anger. This happens all the time when parents do not know how to control their anger with their kids. You ever been around parents and they're yelling at their kids all the time and they're, hey, sit down, sit down. You know, I just hate to go into a, a store like, let's just say Walmart, and a kid is out of control and and they're just they're just dragging the kid along, you know, just dragging them along, and they're yelling at them, and they're just, uh, you know, shut up, shut up, and it's loud, and everybody can hear it, and it's just, it's terrible. We had a very unfortunate thing that I think happened here, um, uh, you know, one time, and uh, where there was a child that. Uh, I mean, I didn't know the child. I didn't know the, I didn't know the parent, uh, and they, and, and the child would 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 beat on the parent, on the parent would hit the parent. You know, it's like, actually hit him in the face one time with with their fist, and it was like, what is that? You know, what is that? What what's going on in that family that is creating all of that? And, I, I just, I just, I'm so uncomfortable when I'm in a, a family situation where the parents are yelling at the children, uh, uh, really for anything. I mean, if they were running out into the road, I would yell out, stop, but past that, there, I, don't, I can't figure out anything that would, where God would want me to yell at, 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 at my children. And uh, if you've ever, uh, watched a child who's constantly being yelled at by one of their parents over a period of time, what happens? Somebody tell me what happens. They yell back. Well, they do yell back. That's exactly what happens. They, the, child, the, the, the child is virtually ignoring everything that the parent is saying to them. You know, the parent's sitting there and they're, they're yelling at the, the, the kid and the kid's playing on a little, you know, whatever it is, and they're not even listening anymore. Children know that anger uh, is not a good emotion. So the greater self-control that you exercise in the midst of a conflict, the greater will be your opportunity to do what pleases God. Now, Scripture is clear. Scripture's clear that the man who, or the woman who honors God, him or her will God honor. So if you figure out what honors God, what glorifies God, God's going to honor you. God's going to bless your life uh, in, in ways that you might not recognize immediately, but he, he will bless you. So the key word that you always want to be bringing to your mind when you're hurt by somebody. Everybody listen. This is the key word. This is the key word for this whole section on anger. It's the opposite of anger. It's the antonym. What is it? Somebody tell me. Self-control. Self you start to get angry. The word that you want God to bring to your mind, the Spirit of God to bring to your mind, is self-control. And you may say, "Well, I, I can't, I can't, I just can't, I, I can't control myself." Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you have a good, strong, meaningful walk with God, you can control it, and you should control it. It's a fruit of the Spirit that's to be exercised in moments of conflict. You guard your tongue. You refrain from speaking your mind. And you find words that allow your personal hurt to calm down. Just calm down in those difficult moments. I assure you that you will be much more satisfied with the results. I want to give you a key principle number one. 72. Key principle number 172. The more angry you become with someone, the more angry that you become with someone, 
the less influence, the less influence you will have with that person. The less influence you will have with that person. I've said this many times that even though I know that I cannot actually change someone who is prone to some chronic negative issue in their life, I still realize that my life, that your life can make an impact and have an influence on that person. Just as they watch you, as they as you model for them what it is that God that God wants to be modeled. Um, and how you respond to the conflict. You always have to keep saying to yourself, I wrote down some questions here. Lord, uh, these are simple questions. Uh, you can make up your own. Uh, th these are just things that help me. Lord, how do you want me to respond? Lord, how do you want me to respond? It's what I'm thinking, how you want me to respond, yes or no? Is how I am thinking what you would do in this situation, Lord? Yes or no? I want to respond this way, but how do you want me to respond? What can I say and do that will make an impact on this other person? And I doubt very seriously that it's going to be anger. It will most likely be words that are filled with grace, words that have kindness to it, that uh, are filled with uh, uh, words that are filled with grace and, and calmness and words that are peaceful, but it will rarely, if ever, be words of anger. Anger only makes the conflict what? Worse. And I say it again, anger only makes the conflict worse. Now, if you're someone, let's say that you're someone that struggles with anger, like, like I did. I, I didn't get angry every day or every week or every month. I just, every several months, I'd just fly off the handle at my wife or kids or something. And, uh, but if you're somebody who struggles with anger and you do not believe that anger is dangerous to every area of your life, then you're not paying attention. You're naive, actually. I would say that you're in some level of denial. We, we talked about a lot of things last week. Uh, it might have been an information overload about how, how anger affects our, our brain neurologically, how it affects our cardiovascular system, and all the other things that we addressed, and I hope that was helpful for you. But anger creates, uh, if it's prolonged, chronic anger and outburst of anger will cause physical Ill illness. Eventually, it, for in some people, especially people that aren't saved, it will cause, it will, it, it, it will not only cause uh, physical illnesses, it will cause mental health issues in those, per those people. It will always cause relational issues. It will cause problems at work. It will cause, uh, ultimately, financial issues lack of judgment and it will greatly impact your ability to obey God and to enjoy any meaningful fellowship with him when you're an angry person you cannot I don't care how I don't care how much you read the Bible I, I don't care how much you read the Bible if you just turn around and you get mad at your mate or if you say something ugly to somebody at work and you get angry and you get frustrated with them you're not having fellowship with God you're not having fellowship with God because God's not going to lead you in that direction. So we know that anger will destroy marriages. It will destroy relationships. It will cause people to not even want to be around you. Period. You can read the Bible until you are blue in the face. You can be the Blue Letter Bible, right? Isn't there a software for that, the Blue Letter Bible? You can read the Bible till you are blue in the face. 
But if you're always becoming angry at people, and especially your loved ones, it's because you are not willing to obey God when it comes to the issue of controlling this area of your life, the issue of controlling anger in your life. You simply lack self-control. Now, this is, a, this is not a, a, a key principle. I got one coming up here in just a minute, but you must, you must appreciate that your emotions are a byproduct of what you're thinking. Your emotions, good or bad, are a byproduct of what you are thinking. That's why it's so critical to bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. If your thinking is out of control, then your emotions are going to be what? So somebody tell me. Out of control. Out of control. Thank you. So if your thinking is out of control or not under control, then your emotions will never be under control. That, that should be intuitive to everyone. You have to ask, be asking yourself the same questions. Where is this anger coming from in my life? Why am I angry? Why, why do I get angry at things uh, in, in, in my life? Is my anger something that's coming from God, is, or is it because I'm stubborn and, and in my stubbornness, I've, I've forfeited self-control. If it's not, if it's not coming from God, and I doubt very seriously that it is, then what is its source in my life? And here's the normal answer that I hear as a pastor. Okay, this is the normal answer on a regular basis that I hear as a pastor. What is? If you wanted to guess what it was, where, where's this anger coming from? What would you guess that I hear all the time? That's right. That's right. Uh, it's coming from somebody else. Um, it's somebody else's fault. It's this circumstance that's making me angry. It's, it's, it's not me. It's not me, oh God, God. It's, it's them. Uh, uh, they're, they're, my, they're the problem, not me. Uh, no, no, anger, if you have anger, anger is your problem. They may provoke it in you, but your lack of self-control is your problem. It's not their problem. So... Uh, Maybe you said, I, man, I just didn't like what they said or how they treated me or that they were not willing to do what I wanted them to do. And I don't deserve this. You know, people think like that all the time. Those are very common answers. It's almost as if the person that is constantly demonstrating toxic behavior in their life towards other people, they're not willing to take responsibility for their toxic behavior for their toxic caustic words that destroy relationships that hurt people rather than actually build them up and all of that comes from not thinking the way that God thinks it all of it comes from not thinking like God thinks you you this this has been a long series this is study 48 this is, we've been in this almost a year, a month away from being in this for a year. And if I haven't driven this point home, then you probably need to get another pastor or something. You want, you, you want, to, you want to do everything in your life to ensure that you are thinking like God thinks. He thinks a lot better than you do. He thinks a lot better than I do. And when I finally figure that out, everything in my life gets better. So here's key principle number 173. Key principle number 173. God does not accept, God does not accept
justifying or blaming, justifying or blaming your outburst of anger, your outburst of anger on someone else. God does not accept justifying or blaming your outburst of anger on somebody else. Let me say it in a different way. Maybe this is the way I should have made this. God does not justify your lack of self-control. God simply does not justify your lack of self-control. That's the very quality that he's wanting to develop in your life by even allowing you to experience the very difficult circumstance that you may actually find yourself in. If you think about it for just a moment, when would you think that self-control was actually needed the most? I mean, this is intuitive, right? When would you think that it was needed the most? It would be during a difficult and a very tense moment, during a time when ugly words and demeaning remarks were being made to you or against you. I, uh, when was this, when did this happen? I, uh, I was going home on Saturday after our discipleship group that we had. It was me and Don. And we, really, we, we left and we, we had gotten in my truck and I was driving. I had a really rough Saturday. Ms. Ruby said, you, you don't look good. And I didn't feel good. And uh, I didn't. And I had a really bad day on Saturday yesterday. And we were... We were coming home and he was telling me uh, about his pastor. And his pastor had, his pastor had um, uh, several years ago, uh, right, right before COVID, when we were having classes at Millbrook, uh, rather than in Springfield, uh, what well, we were having in both places actually, and but, but before that, uh, Don was a student, or he, he would audit the classes, and so he would come. And so his his uh, pastor somehow came up in a conversation. Uh, what are you doing on that night? He says, "Well, I'm going to class. I'm going to a class with Covington." And the next thing I know, the the guy is the guy is not only criticizing. Covington, but he is attacking me. He has never met me. He has never met me. He has never heard one message that I have ever taught. He's never sat in any class that I have ever that I've ever developed, and the, he believes that I. Uh, he, he's a he's a cow. He's a non-reformed individual, which is fine, which is fine. If you sit in the class that I teach on the difference between reformed and non-reformed theology, he, he would walk away satisfied. We all do the same thing, right? We preach the word, we pray, we evangelize, we, we're involved in missions, we, uh, we, we, we love on people, we, we try to hurt, uh, help those that are hurting. We all do the same thing, and whether or not Foreknowledge is here or foreknowledge is there in the order salutis. So it just doesn't, it's not critical. So he's taken up somebody else's offense against me that happened uh, down in Windsor and, he, and he's, he's, he's spoken ugly and demeaning of me personally. And uh, I just had to, uh, you know, Don's talking to me on the way home and, and I just... Uh, I said, well, Don, I said, if, uh, if you want me to, I, you know, I'll be glad. I'll be glad to go and, uh, and meet with him if you think that was necessary. I, I said, the associational missionary, the, the, the association that he's in is a different one than ours. And, uh, and the associational missionary said the same thing about me. Do I, do, do I look like a false teacher to you? No, I don't think you do. 
I, I mean, I mean, do I even teach like one? I mean, you come here because there's nothing that's right. And are we asking for money here? <laughs> you know, uh, we. I don't. I don't even. I'm the only, I, the only person I know. The only thing I know about money is what Brenda and I give. I have no clue what anybody else gives. You could give ten cents or ten thousand dollars a week. It, it, I wouldn't know the difference. And I. It's just like, where did somebody come up from this? Well, it came from a deacon in a local church that had another student that was a Covington graduate and he was just going through Romans and he got to the word elect and they, 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 they said, you're a Calvinist. We don't, we don't want a Calvinist and they got rid of him. I'm listening to all this nonsense and all I could do is just, I just all I could do is just feel sorry. That's all, I just felt sorry for people that live that way, that don't have enough grace in their life to just not say something ugly about demeaning about other people that they that they don't understand anything about, you know. Am, am I angry about it? Everybody, everybody, answer that question for me. Am I angry about what was said about me? Yes or no? no. I'm not. I'm not angry at all. I'm not upset. I'm not mad. I don't feel hurt. I don't feel anything about that. that. I feel sorry for somebody that is so casual in what they communicate about an individual that they've never met that it grieves me for, for that person. So, you know, when you, when somebody's mistreating you or lying to you, maybe even yelling at you, uh, that's when you need self-control the most. Uh, self-control is for those difficult moments. You say that again, self-control is for the difficult moments. Now you can say, I, I would say that, well, you, you know, you probably ought to exercise self-control uh, for not overeating or for not binging on chocolate cake every day. Y'all didn't eat enough of the chocolate cake on Wednesday night. I had to take a half, half of it home. And my wife rarely ever eats it. And when it's gone, you know, I'm the one that's, I'm the one that's, ate, you know, that's uh, eating the rest of it. But, uh, uh, but its primary use is intended to help you in the most difficult moments of your life. I love self-control. I just love it. I love not being angry at anything and everything. We, the elections are coming up, you know, we pray, uh, Chris prayed for it. They're coming up here in a couple of days and who, who knows what's gonna happen. It's out of my control. You know, I, I might have a little bit of righteous indignation about it, but I'm, I'm not gonna go ballistic on anybody. It, it is what it is, that's just the way the system works. And that's, so this is when you want self-control to be completely governing your life in the most difficult moments that you may have. Now, I want to make a strong statement to you at this point. I'm going to repeat something that I, I just I said earlier, but I, 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 want to, I, want to, I want to I want to emphasize a, a part of this. Uh, you cannot blame somebody else for your toxic words or your toxic behavior. And I want to say that you cannot blame the devil. Uh, you know, there's this, uh, there's this uh, comedian one time when I was growing up, his name was Flip Wilson, and he said, the devil made me do it. And everybody just kind of laughed. No, the devil doesn't make you do anything. You do. You, you do. You do. You do it. The devil doesn't make you do anything. He may lie to you and get you to do something that you shouldn't do, but he doesn't make you to do it. And God's not going to accept that you can blame your, your own bad behavior on somebody else or on the enemy. Why, why is that? Everybody listen. 
It's because God holds you personally responsible for your behavior. God holds you personally responsible for your behavior. And until you're willing to take full responsibility for your behavior, you will never make any significant progress in your spiritual life. God holds you responsible. God holds me responsible for what I say, for what I do. And I'm never going to make any meaningful spiritual progress until I take responsibility for what I say and what I do. You'll just continue to be a slave to your toxic thoughts, your toxic words, your toxic behavior that hurt you, both you and other people. When Adam and Eve both sinned, Eve blamed the serpent, right? She blamed the serpent. And Adam, when God talked to him, he, he blamed his wife, right? Uh, he passed the buck, she passed the buck. Uh, neither one of them took responsibility for, their, for what they did, for their disobedience. And God didn't just say, oh, no, no, no problem, uh, no, no big deal, I understand, I'll forget about that. Well, that's not the way that it really worked out at all. Where God just says, no big deal, no problem. He said, I want to curse, the ground's going to be cursed here. You're going to be, for you women, you're, you're going to bear children in labor. You're going to have thorns and thistles, and things are going to get a little bit more difficult. That's, that was the consequence of their disobedience, and they're well documented, because neither one of them were willing to take responsibility for the wrong choices that they had made. So if you're not willing to take responsibility for your angry behavior, you will become a prisoner to the lies of the enemy. You, you will become his prisoner. He will encapsulate you in his lies. That's a fact and probably is exactly what has happened to you. In Ephesians 6.10, you don't have to turn there, it says you're encouraged to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. Do what God wants you to do, right? Just be strong in the Lord. You can be strong in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 and 16. Verse 13 says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God. Put on everything God wants you to put on so that you can be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Not just fight back, not just argue, not just complain, not bellyache. Just stand in what God wants you to do. Just stand in it. Just do what God wants you to do. In verse 16, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith. You've got to believe God. You have to trust God with your life. Take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Every one of them. I love the word all. You know, we know that anger is debilitating to your body. It's, anger is systemically debilitating. What most people do not realize is that the way that you think has a direct uh, relationship to the way that the proteins in your body are synthesized, how your enzymes work, how your brain's neurochemicals work uh, with the rest of your body. They all work together for either good or bad. So if you're somebody that's prone to anger, you've got all of that working against you. You've got all of that physiologically, systemically working against you in, in your life. And if I can say it in a very simplistic way, you have to do your own brain surgery. You have to do your own brain surgery when it comes to toxic thinking and toxic behavior. You only behave a certain way because you think a certain way. You act a certain way because you think a certain way. You have to understand that God has made your brain in such a way that the more 
that you exercise your brain in a godly direction through continual persistence that it will change you permanently. It will change you permanently. That's the good, that's the really good news is that when you think right, it makes permanent changes on your life. And until you get to that place where you're willing to think like God thinks day after day, week after week, month after month, those changes are probably not going to be made. Listen very carefully. If you do not believe that God Almighty in heaven has given you the spiritual power to change how you think so that you can control your toxic behavior and outburst of anger, then you will never change. You will never change. If you do not believe that God Almighty in heaven has given you the power to change, you will never change. Why stay? Why stay the way that you are when you know that it's not what God desires for your life? You can't give me a good, a good reason. I know that you will fail at times. I know that we'll all fail at times. I'm, 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 when I say you, I mean me too. But when you fail, that does not mean that you have to continue to fail. It only means that you need to keep trusting God with how he wants you to think so that he can continue to transform your life to be Christ-like in every area. Transform your ungodly thinking and behavior into Christ-like thinking and behavior. Listen, listen very carefully. I should have made this a, a key principle. I didn't. You must understand that failure is God's way of growing a believer. Failure is how God helps you to grow. It's his way of helping you. You fail, it draws you closer to him. You say, Lord, I, I didn't want to do that. And you fail again and you just... Lord, I didn't want to do that. And before you know it, God has built a neural pathway where you don't do that anymore. I want to give you a couple of brain facts. These are kind of interesting. These uh, come from Dr. Um, Caroline Leaf. I love her book, Switch on Your Brain is what it's called. Um, the first is that the intervention of your mind to deal with a personal struggle that you're having with somebody, it changes your brain physically, chemically, structurally, and functionally. The intervention of your mind, whatever's good, whatever's lovely, Think on these things, right? It helps you. It changes your brain physically. But if you don't let it, if you don't let your mind intervene with what God's word has to say is the best thing for you to think, then your destructive behavior will continue. Number two. Research shows that there's no more effective way to produce localized and specific changes in the brain than behavioral and mental intervention. So if you know that you're not living right in a certain area, uh, in, in this area, anger, you want to have some mental intervention you got to think about it. you got to figure out this is not what God wants for my life. Yeah. That. Research shows that there's no more effective way to produce localized 
and specific changes in your brain than behavioral and mental intervention. I mean, no wonder God encourages you to meditate on his word and not to lean into your own understanding. Let's assume that, once again, this is the third time I'm assuming that you find yourself in a toxic circumstance with somebody who you know will become angry or has the potential of making you angry. Anger is kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky. Sort of like a flash fire that can be brought about but just a spark of fire you know my wife is out there um, you know a couple months ago or something and six weeks ago and cooking something on the grill and and all of a sudden that there she started it up and it just you know a ball of fire and caught her hair on fire and blistered her eyebrows and her lips and all of that just uh, very, very, very tricky. I think that anger is like that. I, I've known people who would become angry in just seconds of something being said. Just seconds. I mean, you can just say anything. It just, just anything. It doesn't matter. It just, it, it can just upset them, and they just, they're agitated, and you can tell that they're agitated by their, you know, their reactions and their facial expressions and all of that kind of stuff. Somebody said something they didn't like, and they were so reactionary to all of it that their first response was an outburst of anger. Were you idiot? No, nobody thinks like that. Yeah, yeah, people do think like that. Here's what research has proven over and over again. I want you to listen very carefully to this. Why don't you listen very carefully, and then I'll give you a verse, and I'll give you a key principle. Research clearly shows that by severely limiting caustic and harsh communication, that the environment to generate anger is greatly removed. Well, the Bible knew that all along. The Bible has taught us that all along. It's that, that's just the application of Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 20 where it says, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. The problem with anger is that it's neurologic, it neurologically generates more anger in your brain. Did you, hear that? Did you hear what I just said? When you become angry, when you're an angry person, it just neurologically generates more anger in your brain. So what if you're with somebody who's always angry with you? What do you do? What do you need to remember in those caustic and toxic moments? Here's key principle number 174. Key principle number 174. Brevity of communication, brevity of communication reduces conflict. Brevity of communication reduces conflict. If you keep putting wood on the fire, what happens? It gets what? It gets hotter, right? And it takes much longer to go out. So what God is revealing here in Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 20, where he says, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. He's not talking about wood. And he's not talking about fire. Everybody understand that? This is an analogy. God is getting across a different point. It's about learning how to diffuse anger, how to control your anger during a major verbal relation, relational or emotional conflict that you are experiencing. Don't put any more wood on the fire. 
brevity of words will help you. So it doesn't become destructive. Listen to me. Listen, everybody, just listen to my heart for a minute. I want you to appreciate that anger never works. Anger never works. If you don't believe me, just keep getting angry. That's all you have to do. It doesn't work with your marriage partner. It doesn't work with your children. It doesn't work with your friends if you've got any left. It doesn't work with your co-workers. It doesn't work with some relationship that you may have with somebody, whatever that may be. Modern psychology will tell you that you need to release your emotions. You need to get rid of them. You need to get, get them out. Say what you want to say. Get your anger off of your chest. There's nothing that could be any further from biblical truth than that nonsense. Nothing. You know, go hide your face in the pillow type thing. Go, go stand in this corner and scream. No. No. That doesn't work. That's not God's solution. In fact, neuroscientific research greatly supports this. Instead of decreasing anger, that kind of counsel in somebody's life actually increases it and can cause irreparable damage to the relationships that you have with people. That's not how you, that's not how you control anger. It's just to go somewhere and scream. Anger is so disruptive to your ability to think like God thinks that it keeps you from making rational decisions and it literally blinds you to the fact that you are actually an angry person. You've got, when you become angry, it, you, you, have, you, you, you reach a level of stress. You're releasing neurochemicals and hormones into your body, harmful hormones and neurochemicals. I want you to think of anger as something that is literally eating you alive by constantly damaging the emotional and regulation centers of your brain. When you get angry, your cognitive thinking, your ability to reason is greatly diminished. I mean greatly diminished. Rather than becoming a smart person, you become a dumb person. Because, you, because of all that's going on in your body physiologically and neurologically. And you'll find difficulty controlling anything about your life at that moment. Your words will be harsh, they'll be ugly, they'll be toxic, they'll be damaging. They'll hurt you, they'll hurt other people. They'll be under control and you'll be out of control. Anger never works, and God says that it rests in the bosom of a what? Say it out loud. Of a fool. Anger rests in the bosom of a fool. Research has also shown that anger and hostility greatly interfere with the body's healing process. I thought this was really interesting. This was just one example that I chose. I could have... Uh, I could have chosen others, but I just chose this one. It's very simple to understand. There was a study that Ohio State uh, School of Medicine, our College of Medicine, did where they, they brought in 42 married couples. And in some way, they created these little small blisters on their arm. Uh, they just, just little blisters that they created on, on their arm in some way. And so they measured the rate of healing and found that it took twice as long for the blisters to heal in those couples who were always arguing and becoming angry with one another. So let's just assume, let's assume at a different level, I'm gonna go from little blisters to something much more serious. Let's just say that you have a form of cancer and you don't know, you don't know that you have it. 
you don't know that you are that you are that you have cancer developing in your body. It's unknown to you, but but you're a very angry person. What's happening in your body is that your anger is systemically causing your cancer to grow at a faster rate. That's not good. Then it normally would grow. It's never good. It rests in the bosom of fools. That's just a everything that I've shared there has that I can prove to you from research. Now, I want to remind you once again that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I think what I'm going to say here uh, and one of the places that we're going to go in uh, 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 next week is the idea that how God has made you is awesome and that you are a very unique individual. But everybody else is too. Everybody else is too. Everybody else has been fearfully and wonderfully made and made in the image of God. And when you see them that way, you will treat them that way. You will treat them with dignity, with kindness, with grace, and with Christ's likeness. When you think like God thinks, it becomes crystal clear that anger has no meaningful, long-lasting place in the life of any Christian, no matter what their circumstances may seem to be saying to them. If God shows mercy and if God grants forgiveness, then so should you. If God is long-suffering, patient in how he deals with you, so should you be. And I beseech you to root out any root of bitterness or anger that you may be that may be persisting in your life because it's literally destroying your life in ways that you don't know until it's way too late. I want to read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, and then we'll close uh, 12, 15. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become Defiled. The word looking carefully means to highly regard and give attention to something in your life so that you do not fall short of the grace of God. And I pray, my prayer for you this morning is that God would grant to you His grace and give an attention to your anger.